Hello, I'm Kimberly, and welcome to the weekend edition of the Native News Update. It's Friday, April 6th, and many of the stories you hear here can be found at IndianCountryNews.com. And here's the news for the day from the Associated Press and other Native News sources. Residents of four Manitoba First Nations are suing the province, alleging the government deliberately flooded their communities last year and didn't take proper care of them after they were forced to evacuate. The First Nations filed a $950 million class action lawsuit this week, and the Statement of Claims says the province knowingly and recklessly caused the disaster in their communities by diverting too much flood water into Lake Manitoba last spring. It also alleges the government didn't give them enough warning about the flooding. The lawsuit, which contains allegations that have not been proven in court, must be certified by a judge before it can proceed. The flooding forced many residents from their homes in April of 2011, and several thousand First Nation residents still haven't been able to return. Although the province has set up dozens of homes at a temporary site near Lake St. Martin Reserve, the lawsuit alleges Manitoba failed to quickly fix damaged homes and failed to provide adequate long-term housing for evacuees. On April 5th, Arizona senators urged tribal leaders to move quickly on a proposed settlement of water rights claims so they can push the bill through Congress before this session ends. A bill Senator Kyle introduced in February would require that the tribes cede claims to Little Colorado River water in exchange for three projects to deliver safe drinking water. But the senators said the plan needs tribal approval before they will move forward. Navajo Chief of Staff Sherrick Roanhorse said that senators are pushing for a tribal resolution by early summer. He said the Navajo Nation will hold seven public hearings this month and will submit comments to the Tribal Council before action is taken. Hopi Chairman Leroy Shingotua said the water settlement did not come in his tribe's meeting with the senators. While he supports the plan, he said he would wait to hear from the Hopi people. As many as 200 protesters opposing the bill showed up outside the meeting. Some opponents have cautioned that the settlement, while providing much needed water, could come at too great an expense. While the Hopi have sued the federal government over arsenic and uranium in their drinking water, for example, the bill would require that they waive future claims water of water quality and loss of traditional springs. In February, a judge adjourned the first-degree murder trial set for March of Curtis Bunnell until September. Bunnell is accused of murdering his 16-year-old cousin Hillary Bunnell from Burnt Church First Nation in 2009. Hillary Bunnell went missing on September 5, 2009, and her body was discovered in a wooded area near Tukati Sheila after more than two months of searching. Curtis Bunnell was charged with her murder that December and has been waiting trial ever since. Justice Fred Ferguson allowed the latest adjournment to give both the defense and the Crown more time to prepare. According to Hillary Brunel's Facebook page run by her family, the next court dates are April 13th and August 24th, and the trial is set to begin on September 17th for eight weeks. Meanwhile, the body of Hillary Brunel remains frozen in a morgue nearly two and a half years after she was murdered because her family is waiting for the criminal trial to be concluded. Just two weeks before she disappeared, the 16-year-old told her mother that she wanted to be cremated. But Pamela Fillier hasn't been able to grant her daughter's wish since the criminal case is still pending. The Crow Tribe is breaking ground on its first project under the new Crow Tribal Water Resources Department. This first $70,000 project will be repair work in part of the Little Bighorn Irrigation System. The Water Resources Department was formed because of the $460 million Crow Tribal Water Settlement Compact. Money from that settlement will be used for irrigation as well as municipal and industrial projects. Dr. Alden Bigman, Jr., director of the Crow Tribal Resources District, said it's a big historically because it signifies a date when we begin to implement Indian self-determination. A lot of other tribes are looking at the Crow to take the lead in this and to see where we'll go to handle it. It is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for the Crow people to make their mark in history. Big Man also says his department has plans to build additional irrigation projects and a new hydroelectric plant. 
Washington State and tribal co-managers agreed on a package of salmon fisheries that meet conservation goals for wild salmon populations while providing fishing opportunities on healthy stocks. Washington's 2012 salmon fishing seasons developed by the Washington's Department of Fish and Wildlife and Treaty Tribal Co-Managers were finalized during the Pacific Fishery Management Council's meeting in Seattle. The fishing package defines regulations for salmon fisheries in Budget Sound, Washington's Ocean, and coastal areas and the Columbia River. In development salmon seasons and catch quotas, WDFW fishery managers worked closely with advisors and members of the public to design state management fisheries that meet conservation goals for wild salmon and result in the fair sharing of harvest opportunities. For more information on fishing season and regulations, you can visit wdfw.wa.gov forward slash fishing forward slash North Falcon. Montana's Fort Peck tribes are getting $1 million from the federal government for equipment to expand oil drilling and manufacturing on the reservation at the edge of the booming bacon oil field. U.S. Commerce Secretary John Brayson said the Economic Development Grant could create 15 new jobs and leverage more than $600,000 in private investment. The money will support the expansion of a metal fabrication facility by Fort Peck Tech Services. It will also buy equipment to advance oil exploration and drilling activities in the Bacon Formation, which is partially located on the reservation. A fully loaded semi-truck with household goods, bikes, and many other necessities was sent to the Lower Brule Sioux Tribe in South Dakota on March 30th. This shipment came from the charity One Nation Walking Together, which is based in Colorado Springs, Colorado. One Nation Executive Director Urban Terzi and Operating Director Kathy Dunson said this delivery was a result of their story being featured in the Hidden Heritage episode broadcast on RFD-TV recently. The episode was produced by Paul LaRush, Shane LaRush, Chris Estes, Goran Coons, and Nicole LaRush, who are also members of the performance group Brule. For more information on One Nation Walking Together, you can visit onenationwt.org. Hidden Heritage produces positive stories from Native America and airs on Monday nights at 6.30 p.m. Central Time and reruns on Tuesday at 8.30 a.m. Central Time on RFD-TV. For more information on the show, you can visit rfdtv.com. And that's another roundup of news from Indian Country on this edition of the Native News Update. I'd like to thank you for joining me and have a grand day.